Um, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So I'd like to thank the organizers of the conference uh, for inviting me and, and certainly uh, Senator Reid for all he's done. Um, the energy problem and what we can do about it. Um, I'm going to be the third speaker that mentions the risks of adverse climate change. Um, but you've heard of many other things, so I'll, I'll concentrate on that. Uh, and I applaud uh, Governor Ritter for saying that this the climate change, yes, people will say, well, we know the climate's changing, let's go beyond that, and it's got to take its place with all the other concerns of the country and the world. But consider this, there's about a 50% chance, the climate experts tell us, that <clears throat> In this century, uh, we will go uh, up in temperature by three degrees centigrade. Now, three degrees centigrade doesn't seem a lot to you. That's 11 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, Chicago changes by 30 degrees Fahrenheit in uh, half a day. But five degrees centigrade means that it's the difference between where we are today and where we were in the last ice age. What did that mean? Canada, the United States down to Ohio and Pennsylvania was covered in ice year round, five degrees centigrade. So think about what five degrees centigrade will mean going the other way, a very different world. And so uh, if you'd want that for your kids and grandkids, we can continue doing what we're doing. The climate change of that scale will cause enormous resource wars over water, arable land, and mountains of population displacements. We're not talking about 10,000 people, we're not talking about 10 million people, we're talking hundreds of millions to billions of people being flooded out permanently. <clears throat> so let me address a frequent called myth that the wealth of a country is proportional to its energy it uses, therefore we can't really um, uh, reduce its, our use of energy. This is a plot and on the x-axis is the amount of electricity consumed per person for various countries. Europe, United States in red, Canada is a little to the right, Norway is all the way to the right because there's a lot of hydropower. And on the y-axis is the essentially the standard of living of countries. It's GDP, but it's also the health care, the education, and so on and so forth. Europe, which is that cluster over one-third the way uh, on the left wants to go down by a factor two, the United States really has to go down and join them in order to make headroom for the developing countries. But the thing I want to, you to pay attention to the fact is that the standard of living beyond a certain energy consumption is absolutely flat. It doesn't improve the standard of living if you use the energy efficiently. Here's another existence proof. Uh, in the first oil crisis, California changed dramatically and it levelized its use of electricity per person. From 1975 to today, it, its use of electricity is essentially flat. The rest of the United States went up by about 55 percent. So this, during that time, the economy of California doubled. So here's another existence proof that it doesn't kill the economy. An economy can flourish even though it's efficient. Here's an example where this is the refrigerators. The average size of an American refrigerator went from 18 to 22 cubic feet. The blue line plots the energy efficiency of refrigerators. It went down by a factor of four. How much did it cost the American consumer? Well, the green line shows the inflation-adjusted price of refrigerators. It went down by a factor of two. Okay. This is not what industry said when these laws were enacted in California. They said the American consumer can't pay for that. And they worked very hard for a couple of years. But in the end, both the Republicans and the Democrats said, no, this is a good thing. We're going to pass this standard. And then what happened miraculously is the manufacturers had to assign the job to the engineers instead of the lobbyists. And this is what you get. <clears throat> the but it's only refrigerators, you say. That blue bar on the left-hand side is the energy saved by going to today's efficient refrigerators from what we had in 1975. How does that compare? Well, the yellow bar is all of conventional hydropower in the United States. The turquoise bar is all of renewable wind and solar in the United States. Think about that. Just refrigerator efficiency. Bigger refrigerators, by the way, it saves more energy than all we're generating from renewables excluding hydroelectric power. 
I cannot impress upon you how important energy efficiency is. It doesn't mean you eat lukewarm food or you keep your food lukewarm and your beers are lukewarm and everything else. You can still have it. It's just you make a better thing. Buildings can be incredibly more efficient. How much more efficient? Well, uh, a number of us, uh, the California Public Utility Commission, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, when we're now uh, working with United Technologies, we feel that buildings can be better than a factor two energy efficient, but more a factor four to five energy efficient and pay for itself in less than 15 years. That would be our target. Because if it's more expensive uh, and won't pay for itself in the life cycle of the building, no one's going to ever build this. If you get to this goal, which is an ambitious goal, but it's realizable, um, that green bar is the amount of energy you will save in electricity, and you compare that. This is only, oh, by the way, it's only commercial buildings, not residential buildings, which are 20 percent of energy use. Commercial is another 18, 19 percent. Uh, the green bar is the energy saved. The blue bar is electricity generation from coal in the United States today. So. Another myth is uh, we have all the technology we need to solve the energy problem. It's only a matter of political will. I think political will is absolutely necessary, and much of this conference talked about things, and I agree with essentially all of them. But we need new technologies to transform the yes, landscape. Yes, we should develop better photovoltaics given today's silicon technology, but we can do much better. And we have several generations of scientists, Alan Heger, who won a Nobel Prize for his work on conducting polymers, it, Paul Vasadas, who I hope in a few more years will win a Nobel Prize for his work on nanotechnology, and Peter Yang. These are three generations of the best scientists we have in the United States who believe that it is possible to make incredibly efficient photovoltaic cells that are much, much cheaper than what we have today and what we foresee in the near-term future. The price of photovoltaics will go down by a factor of two or three. You can bank on it. I'm not sure it can go down by a factor of five to ten. If it goes down by a factor of ten, you won't even need all the price subsidies and everything else. What's the probability that this was, is going to happen tomorrow? Well, small. But there may be a five percent chance this year. We're looking at a number of uh, areas. Five percent chance per year. You haven't several good ideas, maybe a 20 percent chance per year. We hope to deliver in five or ten years. Fire us if we don't. Um, biomass is an, another thing which has great promise. I don't mean corn biomass or sugar beet or soybean. I mean better stuff. Uh, grasses that require far less energy inputs, that far, require far less water, that doesn't compete with prime agricultural land. This crop of grass growing outside of University of Illinois yields 15 times more ethanol per acre than corn, not twice as much, 10 to 15 times as much. That grass was not fertilized or watered. You mow it down, it grows back the same height, which is just in case you're wondering, she's five foot three inches tall. Um, at Berkeley Lab, in the first eight months of a new research program, we've developed ways to separate out the cellulose, the, the sugars that you can turn into fuel from the protective stuff in the plants. We've already made a yeast. Normally you feed sugar to yeast and it makes ethanol. It's a 5,000 year old technology. Ethanol is good stuff, but I'd quite frankly rather drink it. Um, this yeast makes a gasoline-like fuel. Already within eight months, we're working on diesel and jet replacement fuels and we need to work I'm making this really scalable so that it will do outperform the yeast that we have today. This is only after eight months of the best basic scientists working on this problem have already come up with so this. So I will leave you with this final image. This is, uh, I was an undergraduate when this picture was taken, Apollo 8, and it shows the moon, it was Earthrise, a beautiful planet, a desolate moon, and focus on the fact there's nowhere else to go.